so my name is Ewan Cameron. I'm I currently work at the University of Oxford, and I work for a group called the Malaria Atlas Project. I used to be an astronomer. That was my PhD training. So I studied galaxy evolution um, for about, well, I did four years of, of uh, PhD, then um, uh, two years of postdoc in astronomy. Then uh, after that, I jumped ship into statistics, and um, from statistics, found my way through into studying epidemiology and public health uh, from a statistical perspective. Um, so I'll just say a little bit more about the type of modeling that I do. Um, then I'll outline the, uh, the plan for the day, and I'll go into my first lecture, which will concern uh, things like model checking and prior choice, um, and should be basically a review of the, um, uh, the, the ways to think about model building and think about uh, applying Bayesian statistics, which I think um, uh, will be sort of implementation independent. So just the ways to think about modeling. Um, and hopefully that's uh, perhaps the most, uh, the most general, the most um, uh, widely applicable part of the lecture. Then uh, in, later in the day, I'll go into some more uh, um, sort of bespoke topics, which, um, which relate to uh, specific types of models. So um, yeah, as I mentioned, I have this uh, background in, uh, in astronomy, so in the study of galaxy evolution. My PhD was from Mount Stromlo Observatory in Australia. Subsequently, I did uh, some postdoctoral study at the University of St. Andrews and at Etihad Zurich. The statistical work that I did was um, uh, at the Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, and it concerned Bayesian topics, particularly this uh, topic of Bayes factor estimation, which is, um, uh, which is a, which, or effectively, the Bayes factor is a ratio of marginal likelihoods. So we've talked about uh, the evidence or the, the marginal likelihood as, uh, as an object which um, you, know, you require if you would like to normalize the prior. As Corin and uh, Brendan mentioned, uh, for most applications, if you are able to write an MCMC sampler, you can draw samples and you can represent the posterior without having to compute the marginal likelihood. But if you would like to um, uh, take the Bayesian paradigm even further and go into the topic of model comparison, then this is where we start to need uh, these so-called marginal likelihoods. So that was, that was one thing which I, I worked a lot on. Uh, another thing was this topic called approximate Bayesian computation, and this is one algorithm which I'll, uh, which I'll touch on a at the end of the day. Approximate Bayesian computation is a method for trying to approximate the posterior distribution when you have a model for which it's too difficult or um, either analytically or computationally to write down the likelihood function. So, uh, instead, if you're able to, if you have a simulation-based model which you're able to generate mock data sets from, then ABC is one uh, approach or one Bayesian approach to um, uh, still recovering some kind of uh, posterior estimates uh, in this circumstance. So, yeah, all of this work was um, was uh, uh, in astronomy and statistics pre-2014. The most recent change in my career was that. Um, uh, after you know working on this uh, sort of these uh, esoteric topics and applied statistics, I was luckily I was lucky in 2014 to be able to join the Malaria Atlas project in Oxford uh, as a senior computational statistician and uh, to work on these uh, interesting topics um, of public health statistics. So the type of models which um, oh I should show you this picture first uh, the type of models which I work on a lot. Nowadays, um, uh, this would be the kind of components we have. So the final output we're trying to get is uh, this sort of product here. So this would be a, um, uh, a map, or in fact, a, um, a sort of a movie or a space-time cube of our estimate for the prevalence of the malaria parasite. So meaning if you go to a particular village uh, in Africa and you sample, say, 100 people from that village, what proportion of people at a given time uh, will test positive for the parasite in their blood. So we make this kind of map by uh, a statistical modeling procedure. So it starts with a number of ingredients. One of those is a huge database of, um, of measurements of prevalence in particular villages. 
So this is a mixture of um, uh, sort of opportunistic data which we have taken from different publications through literature review, uh, as well as a um, collection of, uh, of national level surveys which more recently they've started to conduct to, to monitor the public health in particular countries. So we, this, is, this would be our, our data set, um, which, is, uh, which we're trying to, uh, which, well, which forms the data component of the likelihood. Uh, to build our predictive model, we want to be able to uh, take, these, take these point estimates of prevalence and smooth them out across space in order to predict, in observation, to predict prevalence in locations which we haven't actually gone and sampled. So to do this, we have a mixture of a random field Gaussian process component, which is a sort of a, um, a prior or an ingredient that we can add which represents a prior over possible smooth functions that interpolate uh, and, and fit between those observed data points. Um, and we add to that some covariates, which help us um, to predict uh, as well in between samples based on the outputs or the, the products from high resolution satellite imaging. So things like maps of temperature or, or proxies for land surface temperature, for um, the greenness of vegetation, or for um, like uh, estimates of the of the amount of standing water in a given area, uh, so we, our models basically combine these these two ingredients, the uh, the satellite images and the data, with a random field model, and and we produce these kind of maps. The maps we make, um, uh, you know, are used to inform public health policy in. Uh, both sort of at a global level, because we provide estimates for the um, uh, World Health Organization, uh, which go into their World Malaria Report. Um, but also, um, we provide bespoke models for national malaria control programs. So on a day-to-day -day basis, a lot of my work revol revolves around this cycle of um, data collection, model building, model fitting, model checking, and prediction and then communicating those results back to the um, uh, con malaria control program partners uh, you know, who we work with. And then uh, they will often then come back to us with some new questions about like, uh, to understand better our model, to um, say push back on some modeling assumptions which, which we've made. Um, and then you know, we, also, so we try to uh, work with them to improve the model and we, we push back ourselves on them to say, well, this, uh, you know, these would be the type of data which would improve the model, and, uh, and we try to make ways to, um, uh, to, gather those, to gather those data and improve our maps. So mostly, but not exclusively, we're working within a Bayesian hierarchical framework, um, which Brendan and, and Corin both, uh, both used in, in their presentations. Um, and within that framework, we're aiming for a high predictive accuracy um, as far as um, something like the mean squared error of our predictions, um, but we're doing it in a statistical sense rather than a um, perhaps would be like the uh, the purely machine learning approach in the sense that we really want to have well calibrated uncertainties, um, and so that would be the the um, uh, the two things we aim for in our work. And I would suggest, um, for the most part, in astronomy or, or other sort of um, applications, are going to be the things. Which you want to you want to bear in mind with um, with uh, uh, you know with building and refining your models is you always want to be improving predictive accuracy for um, say out of sample prediction, um, but doing so in a way that you keep your uncertainties well calibrated. Um, and I'll talk in my first uh, in the first portion of my lectures um, about what it means to have well calibrated uncertainties. Uh, this picture here is uh, just like a, a sort of a pretty visualization of one of the maps that we made uh, for Haiti, um, or for this uh, Malaria Zero consortium, which aims to eradicate malaria from Haiti. And it's like a three-dimensional view showing uh, from our posterior predictive model what our confidence is um, for given regions as to the question whether malaria cases there would exceed a rate of 10 cases per thousand. Uh, per, fa per thousand people per year of observation. So this is a um, sort of a map-based summary of our posterior. Um. So the lecture plan looks like this. Um, this first section, I'll talk about pragmatic approaches to Bayesian model building. The second session, I will introduce the Laplace approximation, which is kind of the um, 
at, at face value is the, is the simplest um, uh, pre, almost pre-computational uh, way of, uh, of evaluating posteriors, but which has actually come back into fashion for certain purposes. And um, we'll see in what way it's come back into fashion uh, with respect to some Gaussian process models. And hopefully by the end of that lecture session, um, uh, we'll, be, we'll have covered enough ground to start a series of exercises using this package called Inla. Um, I realize some of you were having difficulty yesterday to, um, to get all these packages installed. When we actually come to these exercises, it won't be until, uh, you know, sort of after, after midday. So if you still have some problems, then during the first coffee break, I think um, either talk to myself or one of, uh, one of the other participants here who has, who has the, probably had the same problem and has managed to figure out a solution. And I think we should um, be ha have all of you sort of um, running R and Inla uh, well in time for, this, uh, for these exercises. So after lunch, I will go on to some, uh, some sort of advanced topics in Bayesian computation, which are like to look at important sampling, sequential Monte Carlo methods, this approximate Bayesian computation I mentioned, and another algorithm called the pseudo-marginal MCMC algorithm. Uh, I'll cover those quite quickly, but then in the final afternoon session, we'll go back over them uh, with a series of practical exercises. Um, one final thing I would say by way of sort of overview to, um, uh, to understand the way that I structured the day uh, is that in a lot of Bayesian computation or, or sort of when you're using Bayesian statistics for a practical problem, these days there are so many good probabilistic programming packages. So these ones which I asked Guillaume to, um, to see if people had used things like Stan or Bugs or um, uh, even something like which came from more of a machine learning background like TensorFlow, all of these packages um, allow you to write very effectively um, a, uh, or to write, to, if you have a built on paper a Bayesian model, you can write down sort of the set of distributions which you think produced your data, then you can write it quite easily, the likelihood and priors in these probabilistic um, sort of coding languages, and then they abstract all of the difficult parts of the calculation as far as uh, working out how to take derivatives or how to uh, optimize or sample from the resulting posteriors. So the first part of the, of the day, I'll really be talking about um, the sort of the, the philosophy of building these models uh, abstracted from the process of actually fitting them. So think, ways of thinking about what the uh, model ingredients are doing, which are really general across uh, all applications. The, in the second half of the day, when I talk about the more advanced algorithms, um, I think it's probably very unlikely that you will ever find yourself needing to code one of these from hand. But um, just like you, know, you probably won't write your own MCMC sampler um, because you have these packages like Stan or JAGS, which will already do a much better job than something you could come up with um, in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, just like for this, it's still useful to um, have some understanding of like the MCMC theory or the SMC theory in order to have a feel for what these packages will be doing under the hood. And I think um, uh, this particular uh, selection of topics, the importance sampling, uh, the sequential Monte Carlo and so forth, uh, maybe ones which you don't see as often talked about within astronomical publications, but which um, uh, will give you sort of access to a variety of, of other probabilistic programming languages, which, um, which I think will be important uh, you know, over the next few years. So uh, with all that, I'll get into my first lecture. So this is uh, pragmatic approaches to Bayesian model building, um, and in particular, thinking about priors and model checking tools. So we've seen um, in the previous two days some discussion of hierarchical models. So uh, these, these are very um, uh, widely used and effectively would be um, the, um, almost every Bayesian model used in practice these days. Oh, sorry, quick question. Yeah. Ah, uh, they should be. Um, I have not actually shared it with uh, yes, yeah, so I need to share it with Guillaume. I can share the slides at um, sort of morning tea, and then we can put it up. Yeah. 
Uh, so actually, that's a good question as far or it's a good point, because I, I put a lot of little references, like in green below, which you may want to come back to to, to read more. Um, so you will get those to you. Um, but yeah, all that to say, um, hierarchical models are um, uh, really the type of model which, which for practical uh, applications is, is most used in Bayesian statistics. The reason that they are so widely used um, is that by writing down your model in this hierarchical structure, you're able to start with lots of small, simple ingredients and build up a, a really complicated picture. Um, so it, in a sense, um, they very quickly allow you with some understanding of, of um, simple sampling distributions to build a model which, um, which is rich in complexity and flexibility. They're widely used in many fields um, and including very much in astronomy. Uh, this example, which I'd show uh, a couple of sketches from, uh, came from uh, a supernova, um, uh, you know, sort of a, a supernova modeling study. And one of the things that uh, you see in the left-hand side is this representation of the hierarchical model as a directed acyclic graph. Um, this is one way that people like to visualize them, and uh, I won't go, uh, you know, too deep into into explaining how the how the DAG representation works. But the way that usually um, uh, you would read them is to say that the at the the final end nodes will be some types of observed data which we have, and then um, each box contains a parameter. If it's a white box, it's a it's a free parameter which is going to be learnt somehow. Um, and the the further back you go, uh, the further you move into the into the hyper parameters and uh, the more sort of esoteric parameters controlling the prior. Um, So yeah, the, the other thing to say about hierarchical models is that um, they, have, so they have this nice representation which, which can help to um, sort of to communicate what the model looks like and, and to understand how its pieces fit together. Uh, but the other really cool thing about them is that for the most part, you can fit them uh, very efficiently and effectively with some kind of um, uh, automatic sampling package. So I think Brendan mentioned briefly uh, Dnest, which is his um, diffusive nested sampling package, that's that's one. Um, there's also uh, languages like Jags or Stan, which focus on um, on another aspect of the fitting problem. But for all of them, basically, it, it just it removes this challenge of you know designing your own uh, your own random walk proposal, tuning that, doing all these kind of fiddly steps. It takes those away from uh, the user and, and um, automates them. And your job then is just to focus on choosing a, a, um, a sensible model structure and, uh, and checking your work to see that you're, um, you're, you've, you're using it correctly and that uh, uh, it's doing what you think it should do. So if we look at a hierarchical model from my own work, look, um, close this. If you look at a hierarchical model from my own work, uh, this is one from, so from malaria prevalence mapping. Uh, the way it's written down would look like this um, in these equations. You'll definitely be familiar with parts of this as far as, um, uh, as, far as the notation. So we've been, Brendan introduced this uh, uh, tilde notation, or he likes to call it twiddle. So the twiddle notation, um, this means uh, effectively is distributed according to. So when we write something like this, this is the top layer of our model, uh, the likelihood we say that the observed data, so in these, if we go to these villages and we observe, um, yeah, we have, uh, we look at n people from the village, then the number of those n people who will test positive for malaria, uh, we're gonna imagine that that is binomially distributed with some underlying rate P, and I is an index which, which uh, labels the village. So uh, at the top of the hierarchical model, we always have the likelihood function. Um, also, another term I'll use for the likelihood function, which I think Brendan uses a lot as well, is sampling distribution. So the reason for that is because um, before we observe any data, um, this binomial distribution is the um, distribution by which we imagine the data to be generated. So it's not just something which provides a... Um, uh, a, a sort of a penalty on the fit to, to bring it closer to the observed data. It is an actual distribution that we imagine data to potentially have been generated from. Um, 
just uh, to say, like the binomial, we've encountered that a couple of times. Uh, it's um, probability mass function looks like this, where you have um, its single parameter p is the um, proportion of times which you think um, uh, you think you'll have a um, a so-called uh, success, or, or like you know, in this case, success can mean um, uh, has malaria. So. It's not always ha it doesn't always have positive connotations, um, but it, interestingly, it takes this combina combinatorial term, which um, which uh, uh, comes from uh, effect or effectively from Pascal's triangle. It's this um, it's called the binomial distribution because this term is effectively the um, uh, it's the the number of each type of each each order of term in a binomial expansion of a given order. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so that's just some, some silly background on the binomial. A typical draw from the binomial, if you would have um, 15, uh, 15 potential people, or a total sample size of 15 people, and a probability of, um, of 0.8, of, of, um, of say being positive for malaria, then on repeated uh, sort of draws from that binomial, uh, you would expect a distribution to look something like this. Um. So at the top of the model, we have the binomial. Um, below that, we have an expression which says, so we, we knew n, the number of people that were in our sample. Um, we observe y, the number of people who are positive. Um, and so well, the, the next step in the hierarchical model is to say something about this parameter p, the underlying rate or proportion, which, um, which we're going to be estimating. So, this would be a very common step in a hierarchical model. Um, it's to apply an, some kind of nonlinear transformation. Um, the particular transformation we use here is this thing called the logit function. Um, it's defined like this. The idea of having a nonlinear transformation is that the, um, uh, the domain or the allowed uh, range of, of values for this proportion is, um, is restricted. So it's a probability. It has to lie between 0 and 1. and um, we. We often want to introduce lots of flexible model components which don't, like the Gaussian process, which don't automatically obey such a, a restricted domain. So what we do is we introduce a nonlinear transformation function which wraps the um, sort of the real line, so negative infinity to positive infinity onto the domain of, of our, that our parameter is allowed to take, so in this case, 0 to 1. And uh, this logit transform express, expressed like this um, uh, effectively does this kind of operation. Um, computationally, the way that we would actually, or the way that a code would actually uh, interpret this model is to uh, apply the inverse logit transformation to this expression in order to evaluate p. Um, as an aside, uh, the, there's a family of models called generalized linear models, which, which describe all of these type of models um, based on um, not having the Gaussian process term, just ignoring that, and having only a set of linear predictors. Um, so all models of this form, which come from the exponential family of, of likelihood distributions at the top, so um, cases where you have binomial data, Poisson data, um, or you know, negative binomially distributed data, and also including just simple normal distributed data, all of these can be um, uh, sort of re or are described by a particular model class where you would just put in some linear predictors introduce an appropriate transformation function. So for the binomial data, it's the logit. For Poisson data, your Poisson distribution is characterized by a rate parameter. This rate uh, has to be greater than 0. So the restriction there is from 0 to positive infinity. And so the natural sort of mapping is the logarithm or in, in uh, reverse the exponential function. So, um, so that, that goes in there. Um, but Basically, this class of models is very well studied in statistics. And uh, if you would look in R, uh, there's this uh, package called GLM, or, or set of functions called GLM, which, um, which can handle these, uh, in a, uh, fitting these models in a frequentist, uh, you know, sort of from a frequentist perspective very quickly. Um, we've been, I've been working on these a little bit with some people like Rafael de Souza um, as far as finding astronomical applications for these types of models. Um, the reason that they're, that, well, I guess the reason that they're of interest is because often in astronomy uh, we will have 
data, which takes, which is say count data rather than sort of a, a data that takes a real number. So, for example, if we would look at um, the proportion of, or so the number of galaxies which are barred galaxies in a given sample. So, say we have five barred galaxies uh, out of ten dis, dis galaxies we looked at. Um, the natural representation of, of that sampling distribution is a sampling distribution over count data rather than, than continuous data. So we would want to, u to, to um, sort of respect that type of modeling structure. So the, perhaps the like, naive case would be um, if people want to represent or to model the dependence of the bar fraction on galaxy mass, um, sort of the, the bad way to do it would just be to take bins of fixed mass, estimate the bar fraction in each bin, and then apply a simple linear regression. Um, a more sort of robust way to do that is to work within this family of generalized linear models, and you can do these things called binomial regressions. Um, so we've seen the first two layers of, the, of this hierarchical model would be the, um, it's the likelihood, a nonlinear transformation layer. Um, the third layer we have here introduces the Gaussian process, um, and in particular introduces what we call a latent variable. So the idea, um, you'll, and you'll hear this term latent variable quite a lot in Bayesian modeling. Um, by, by latent, it means hidden. So this is a variable which we never observe. Um, it's also valid to consider this as a, well, it's, it's true, to consider this as a parameter of the model. It can be a parameter which um, uh, corresponds, like that there is a parameter for every single observation in the sample, which would be the case here. There's a, there's a particular, well, there's a particular realization of the Gaussian process for each village. So it's, it's um, uh, when we introduce this, this, purport, this component of the model, uh, what we're doing is we're massively expanding the uh, dimensionality of our problem. So we, um, if we would, have not had this Gaussian process, rep process model here, then we just have an ordinary logistic regression in which uh, there's a small vector of parameters, beta, which would be the slopes and maybe the intercept term uh, acting on our different predictor variables. But to get a really sort of rich, flexible distribution, we'll, you'll often see that we introduce this thing called a latent variable. In this particular case, uh, our latent variable is a Gaussian process, and that is effectively, it's, it's what's called a stochastic process, um, and it's a very flexible kind of prior over the, over, the, um, over the space of functions. It sounds very abstract. We'll come back to this later on uh, in, in the second lecture and actually really look, uh, you know, in practice, how Gaussian processes look and, uh, and sort of demystify this idea. Uh, it's, very, it's very grand to say, you know, we have... Uh, uh, this magical distribution over functions. Um, in reality, there um, uh, it's it's somewhat more pragmatic and uh, and uh, and not as exciting. But um, and all that to say, we we have here a latent variable um, as our third model layer. Um, the latent variable that we introduce uh, has a pri has well itself is a prior, effectively the Gaussian process, and it requires. Um, additional parameters to describe how it works. So you can see that we've got this model where we started with like a simple representation of the likelihood. We, um, we added a, a nonlinear transformation where we brought in uh, some, some linear terms, and, this, uh, and, then, and we, then we added with this um, Gaussian process a bunch more parameters to the model. So you know, we start to have um, uh, more and more parameters, and eventually, um, uh, we, ha we want to kind of close the loop and stop adding priors and, and, and you know, just effectively close our problem. And that comes usually in, these, um, in the top layers of a hierarchical model in which we specify our priors on, on which we, which we complete the specification of priors. So here we add some priors, uh, just normally distributed um, priors on the slope parameters. And then uh, here at the very end, we add some priors on, um, on any remaining hyperparameters. So this is sort of often looks kind of unsatisfying when people write down hierarchical notation like this. Uh, you know, we, I'll show you, I sort of I show you like part of my hand, but I don't show everything all at once written down like this. 
Um, it's very common to, to do this to, um, to avoid getting into the, like, the nitty gritty of, of how you actually uh, finish off the model. Um, usually you would describe this, say, you know, in the supplementary inf information of the paper. Um, but you'll see this notation quite a lot in statistics where um, you know, we're going to say we finish our model by adding a, some kind of prior on the hyperparameters of the Gaussian process and we'll use this uh, placeholder distribution pi. Um, it's obviously not pi as in uh, 3.14. It's just uh, pi represents some as yet unspecified probability distribution. Um, I'm not sure if I have anything more to say on that. Um, oh, yes, I do. I have one more thing. It's um, to point out that um, one thing you, I think you would sort of have started to appreciate from Corin's exercises um, already is that um, when we have these models where we're building them up from lots of little components, um, the further down the hierarchy, hierarchy we go, um, you know, the, um, the further away from the likelihood we go, the more um, important becomes the choice of, um, of the priors. So, if, um, so parameters which are close to the likelihood uh, you know, in, provided there's some signal to noise there in the data, uh, tend to be very well, very well constrained uh, by observations. So the actual, um, uh, the, the sort of, the underlying rate or underlying proportion parameter which you learn for a given village is generally very accurate. Like, um, you know, it's, if we have just, uh, say, 30 observations of people and, and five people are positive, then our estimate for P is really going to stray far from 5 divided by 30. Um, but as we go further down this, um, uh, down this modeling uh, kind of, uh, further through this modeling structure, and we start to look at what are our, our estimates for more abstract terms, uh, such as um, what would be our estimates for these hyperparameters of the Gaussian process, um, then these are less close to the actual observed data and are, are more dependent on the priors. <laughs> Uh, in a way which you'll see uh, becomes increasingly clear. Ewan? Yep. What's the X, the capital X? Um, oh, okay, yeah, that's a good point. So here, this is also a very common sort of statistical notation. Um, X represents a um, matrix of, um, of some independent variables which you will um, use in order to help predict the mean. So um, uh, in our particular malaria example, X would be a matrix um, which is um, sort of capital N by small m in size, where capital N is the number of, um, of uh, locations we observe at, and m is the um, uh, number of variables we have. So we'd have like temperature, rainfall, and so forth. Uh, so it makes this matrix, and you multiply it against uh, beta, which is a vector um, of, of length m, um, you know, sort of an m by one vector, which would be the slope coefficients. So, um, so you see this in linear regressions where um, uh, you want to regress, say, galaxy mass um, plus galaxy age against uh, like the probability of having a bar. In this case, uh, if you had 30 galaxies, say, for which you had mass and age observations, you'd put those into a, um, into a, into a matrix and you multiply that by, the, um, by a vector of length 2, which contains the, uh, your estimates of the slope. Uh, you know, sort of, 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 the, uh, of the slope which describes the, the strength of the effect of those um, covariates on, on the dependent variable which you're fitting against, which in this case would be, say, um, you would imagine as the bar fraction. Um, so I thought it's sort of a, something to think about. Um, I wrote as discussion, but maybe the room is a little bit too large to to have it as a proper discussion, but it's something that would be worth to think about and maybe, um, uh, like, say, chat to your neighbor with at some point uh, over the break, would be, like, try to imagine, like, what ingredients you might have if you would want to build a hierarchical model um, in order to estimate something. Um, can be whatever you like. But one example would be, like, to estimate how many of you will, are likely to submit your PhD theses within the next 12 months. So the idea would be just to, um, Think about this as a modeling problem. Um, we don't have to think about specifically how we're going to sample it or, may, or even to say what 
uh, exactly uh, the distributions which, which will describe all the elements, um, but to think what information you might want to bring into the model, where it would fit within that hierarchy, and, um, uh, and what parameters then would, would need to be estimated, what priors you would put on them, and how you would connect them to a likelihood. Um, I guess you don't have to think about this question if, uh, if it fills you with dread. Um, you might focus on, you know, some kind of other modeling problem, who will win the World Cup, this type of thing. But I find it very helpful to think about how you would build a hierarchical model for a problem which, uh, you know, this is like an arbitrary problem of interest, not necessarily one you're working on. Um, because, yeah, you will see, uh, kind of, you know, get quite quickly, I think, get a feel for the idea that, um, uh, you know, at this, when you're building the, mo when you're building the model, um, and you're thinking it hierarchically, that you are relatively unconstrained as far as um, like having to think, oh, is this, um, is this a linear regression? Do I need to um, you know, go and get the linear regression textbook and, and learn all about those? Um, you know, rather, you, you can think, um, what, what information do I want to bring in? Um, what how do we think that information is related to the thing I'm trying to predict? And then um, how would I sort of order that in a series of, um, of, uh, of you know, of incre or decreasingly abstract things from um, leading up to the actual observation um, or the, the sampling distribution or the likelihood function. Uh, so you, you, just, uh, you just brought this up for us to think about, but mm. can you quickly walk us through a, you know, a possible example? Because the thesis, I mean, I guess you would also start with the binomial, meaning you're either going to submit yep. it or not and then you add your layers. Could you just give us an example of what you would do in this case? So. Yeah, OK. Yeah, that's probably fair. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about the thesis one, and then you can think for yourselves about another problem of interest. So yeah, for, for the thesis example, um, uh, Guillaume is right. You definitely are going are gonna to want to start to think about, OK, what is the, um, what is the likelihood function? And to do that, as, as we saw in the first questions, you want to start by thinking, like, what is the actual data? So the thing, um, uh, or the thing that we're trying to predict here is going to be like, uh, the number of people that will submit their PhD theses. Um, in this case, uh, it's, it's, it's obviously an integer. Um, it is going to be binomially distributed um, with a um, uh, where the total number of people uh, um, uh, you know, in, in the sample size is the number of people in here, so 65 or something. Um, and so you're going to want to have at the top layer, like just like in this previous example, it would be a binomial. Uh, when you start to think about, so the number of people who do submit would then be uh, the future observation. The number of people who could submit, potentially, uh, out of everybody, would be this n. Um, we then need to think, okay, how are we going to start to model this rate? Um, you might then say, well, like, what are the factors that go into that rate? Well, we're going to have some proportion of people will have already f submitted their theses, so they're, they're never going to sort of really uh, be contributing to this P, or they're going to be dragging it down. Um, some people are, you know, before the PhD thesis, so, um, so they're not going to be contributing. So what we might do is we might say, well, um, why don't we take some additional information, like find out people's ages there, so we could say, Let's get data on age, and, and we'll introduce then a term which would be, um, uh, uh, which perhaps um, we have to, well, we, we say we're going to int introduce age somehow as, as a um, predictive variable for this probability. Um, and so that our, our total prob or our effective probability will be composed of contributions from each person of a given age. And then we say, well, like what might the um, dependence on, our, on age look like? It's probably not linear because, um, you know, certainly uh, if you're too, well, if you're from going from high school to university, uh, you know, through to masters and PhD, <clears throat> obviously your probability of, um, of, you know, getting up to that PhD phase uh, increases with age, but then at some point it's got to turn over. So we would say, well, let's not just introduce age uh, as our only thing. Let's say let's have age squared so that we might be able to make some kind of uh, concave function. Um, we might then also go, OK, there's got to be some other types of data that we could introduce. Um, uh, you know, maybe a model for um, like uh, where people come from. If we would imagine that different, um, you know, different 
uh, countries have different typical lengths of PhD program. So um, we might say, uh, like, okay, we'd probably bring in some information of nationalities, but then, well, we don't know for each, um, for each country, like, um, how long, uh, you know, how long those PhD programs are. So we'll introduce a distribution over those lengths and we'll constrain that with some extra information and so on. And so, um, you know, for each sort of new piece of information you add, you then have to think about, well, how does it contribute to, um, you know, to, to some of the higher parameters which lead to um, uh, something that goes into the likelihood function? And uh, you have to think about, um, does it bring in something additional which we don't precisely know and we then want to uh, constrain with a prior um, and possibly add some more data for. And so, uh, you know, you eventually get this uh, uh, sort of blossoming, uh, you know, potential range of models, which, um, which you, is like sort of, like hopefully an ever more complex and realistic description of the process. Um, and then, you know, the final step maybe would be to say, okay, Practically, some of these things we won't really be able to get data on, so we would trim the model a little bit and come up with something parsimonious. Um, so I suppose that's the way I think about this particular one. Um, yeah. How would you weigh the different components that you add in your model? Um, how do you mean to weigh them? Well, some, some you will consider to be very important, and others you'll consider to be a lot less important, but still mm. you know, useful. Yep. So h how would you, I mean, is it just the different layers of the model? How do you... Um, yeah, you no, that's, that's a good point. I think um, if we would just restrict ourselves to thinking about um, uh, the effects of different linear predictors, um, then uh, how we weight them will be a mix of, um, uh, you know, if we, if we would, would be a mix of two things. It's definitely going to be a, a contributed by the prior. So the thing to think about before we have any data is to say, um, uh, which ones do we a priori I think are the most important, and which uh, you know could conceivably uh, be more important than others? So um, uh, we, generally speaking, if we would have a term which also contributed to the the age squared, we'd say typically this this should be um, of smaller magnitude than the than the first order term. So we might make some kind of argument like that to choose our priors. Um, the actual nature of prior choice, I'll I'll talk about a bit later. Um, that would be, the, I, so yeah, I guess I might stop there and say that that would be kind of the primary thing to think about is, is, um, uh, is thinking about your prior choice for, as, as the mode of the weighting or as the mechanism for weighting. Sorry, and what yeah. did the Gaussian process in this case? Yeah, in this case, for, for predicting the thesis submissions, um, we may not have a Gaussian process at all, I think. I mean, uh, yeah. It's, that would be something to think about if there is, like, you don't just introduce a Gaussian process, uh, you know, like, for no reason. You would you introduce it because you need it. Um, I don't see a particular reason that we might need it, but um, uh, the, the Gaussian processes come in where we have um, uh, sort of some latent variables or, or, or factors which are, um, which share some kind of relationship, which we might want to capture as far as, um, uh, like so, one one way it generally comes in is for spatial models. If we might say that, like um, you know, people uh, um, in the north of Europe uh, tend to um, you know have a shorter PhD length than in the south, or, or vice versa, we could do that with a linear term. But then, if it was not as simplistic as as a linear relationship, then we might say, okay, we'll put a Gaussian process uh, on, on the underlying on, a, on a, something which represents the underlying length of PhD programs as a function of space in Europe. This would be perhaps like the type of thing. Yeah. Um, so as sort of Guillaume led me to talk about, I will go now into a discussion of um, uh, three different ways to think about choosing priors. We've, um, uh, you, we've definitely talked a lot about priors. And uh, in Corin's talk, we saw some, well, we started to see uh, some of these, these kind of issues come up as far as um, seeing how the effect of a bad prior choice uh, would be on the model. For example, leading to, um, you know, like a terrible prior choice could, in this case, lead to a posterior that couldn't be normalized or led to, um, I guess, in principle, if you didn't, if you had a prior which allowed those distances to go negative, then it could lead to inferring negative distances. So 
Um, so we definitely got a flavor for, for how priors, or some of the ways in which priors, uh, prior choice needs to be thought about. So I describe here three ways to think about priors. Um, the first one is the one, I guess, which you, you kind of come to naturally um, when you first begin to think about Bayes' theorem. So this is the sense of um, imagining Bayesian inference as this uh, fundamental uh, rational decision-making paradigm uh, within the experimental process where we, we go through this, uh, you know, this sort of idealized scientific model of making predictions, designing an experiment to make some observations, updating our predictions, and so forth uh, in this nice cycle. Um, and in this sense, we, um, the way to think about prior knowledge is really as existing knowledge. So, um, you know, if I, um, uh, well, I, I, the way that Brendan introduced it um, was via that, or at least introduced Bayes' theorem, was via a disease model, and a very similar one uh, I would suggest here, um, which actually comes from the NHS breast cancer screening leaflet in the UK, which they give out, uh, kind of demonstrates this application of prior knowledge, where our prior knowledge um, would be um, knowledge of the population pr level prevalence of a disease. So in Brendan's example, I think it was Ebola, um, where we imagined some population level sort of estimate. And then the question was, if you test positive, I might be misremembering, but the way I remember it is, the question is, if you test positive, uh, you know, from some, like, uh, you know, um, Ebola test, then what is the likelihood that you actually have the disease? Um, and so this type of model, uh, I think, the, the concept of the prior is introducing knowledge it makes a lot of sense because um, it is possible to know from having observed previous data what the, um, what, the, what the underlying rate of some disease actually is. It's something that we really can, uh, you know, sort of, I think, philosophically consider ourselves to be able to know. Um, and so, yeah, the way that the Bayes' theorem, or that this contributes and it flows through Bayes' theorem uh, is... Um, is quite straightforward and it feels very natural. And um, the reason I show this particular example is that it's, it's so natural um, that it was, it was sort of thought to be um, uh, worth uh, explaining or, or presenting um, in this way for, um, for the general public. So um, in, the, in this um, initiative, the NHS was, like, conducted a panel to work out what are good ways in order to convey this type of uncertainty and this type of probabilistic thinking. Um, and what they came up with was like a two-tiered approach. So you get the, um, uh, when you're invited for screening, you get this brochure which um, basically applies Bayes' theorem, or in, a, in a sense, or at least it applies a, con a series of conditional probability statements and allows people to um, uh, you know, get a sense for um, uh, the way that, um, that there is this uh, base rate um, of, um, of breast cancer. The test itself uh, has some, uh, um, some limits to its accuracy, and then there would be like a triage of, of different possible outcomes um, uh, given a positive test. Um, so this, this is the first level, and then if you, and then if you read the brochure, you can um, uh, follow up with like a supplementary bit for people who have, who like you know, want to like learn even more about the different uh, studies that contributed to the estimate and the way that it's made. Um, but yeah, so this is this is the first way I'd say of thinking about prior knowledge. It's um, knowledge. It's this. It's this idea of actually being able to know to know a parameter in some sense. And I would say it's most, uh, it makes most sense or it's most applicable to, pr to parameters that sit close to the likelihood. So they're, they're, they're not so abstract. Parameters which describe, say, the proportion of people in this room you know, who like football or something. That's something which, um, which is, it has almost a kind of a, a concrete sense uh, which, we, which we could hope to know it. The other, oh, so, However, this type of thing is it's very less, it's very much less clear um, how we would um, frame this kind of thinking or how we'd apply this, this um, sort of version of, of prior choice or, or um, you know, understanding the prior to these kind of hyperparameters and things which lie at a very deep level within the hierarchy of um, hierarchical Bayesian models. So the example for Gaussian processes is um, if we have a two-dimensional Gaussian process the um, kind of realizations of that process are controlled by a number of parameters 
um, usually about three, one of which is this so-called smoothness of the field. And so this, uh, these uh, figures show two realizations, uh, one from a Gaussian process with a, um, with, which is, you know, has a parameter saying it's very smooth, and the other saying it's less smooth. Um, the nature of the smoothness is you can sort of, you can see it visually. Mathematically, it um, uh, relates to the differentiability of the fields. Um, and I would say that, you know, it's, for many cases, if we would have, say, like, like the malaria model, we introduce a Gaussian process which we imagine, uh, you know, it helps us to predict malaria. Um, it's not something which we actually, uh, we don't believe that there is fundamentally this physical surface of, of um, like, of hidden malaria proportion which is actually generated by such a Gaussian process. And even if it was, we don't have um, really uh, a sense in which we could actually know that its differentiability. It's, um, it's, it's really something abstract, and uh, um, I think sort of it's unhelpful to think about that as, as um, something which we could have um, prior knowledge of in this type of sense. So for that reason, um, you know, like, what do we do when we want to choose a prior on something that's relatively abstract like that? Um, and I think uh, in this case, um, uh, sort of model development comes down to something much more pragmatic, a little like we saw um, in Corin's talk with some of the prior choice, where um, uh, we want to think about the other things that our prior might do for us. And so um, uh, one of the main things the prior can do, uh, or a good prior can do, is to provide regularization. So to prevent a model from, or f prevent parameters of a model from going into a space which, uh, we, which isn't helpful to us or which in some sense isn't allowed. So um, uh, one case was for, um, was for these parallaxes where um, uh, you know, the distance can never, be, um, can never be negative, but you could, um, you could observe a negative parallax, um, uh, or you could have a negative observed parallax because of the noise in the data. So you introduce a prior which, which um, focuses all of its weight on positive values. Um, but that's, that's not the only type of example we would have. A, um, uh, these sort of examples appear uh, are really everywhere in statistics. Um, one of these would be for these um, so-called so binomial regression models I mentioned, in which um, <coughs> we would say, <coughs> excuse me, uh, in which we would say we're going to try to predict the probability of of a particular type, say like the probability of you could imagine this as the probability of a galaxy being barred um, as a function of its mass. Um, and we're going to introduce a logistic regression model which um, says that it depends, so the logistic function makes like a smooth relationship uh, of this probability with mass. But it turns out that if we're really unlucky and um, our, our, the galaxies in our sample just happen to make a perfect separation here, so um, it just happens that all of the unbarred galaxies are say less than 10 to the 9 solar masses and all of the barred galaxies which we observe uh, by chance all happen to be above that mass, then a maximum likelihood estimate would say, <clears throat> well, the best, uh, the best fitting logistic regression model would basically be a step function, so it pushes its slope up to infinity. <clears throat> we know that this model or that this sort of um, estimate has, uh, has occurred um, just by chance. You know, we could, be, we could take this data to indicate that it's very likely that the slope is steep, but we know for sure it's not infinite, so we, we want to introduce our, a prior which um, effectively curtails these kind of um, unlucky realizations of the data and, um, and uh, avoids like, this type of overfitting. Other ways models can be easily be badly behaved would be, um, I mentioned this idea of a design matrix, so um, where we want to make predictions based on a, on a collection of, of ob observable independent variables which, which help our estimates. Um, in the case that we have more potential variables to predict with than we have observations, then the model is, is um, uh, ill-defined and, uh, and we won't be able to take, like, say, the simple matrix solution of linear regression. So in this case, we need to um, introduce a prior structure which, um, which uh, allows us to, to sort of proceed and, and, and effectively um, uh, construct a posterior from something which otherwise um, is um, mathematically poorly behaved. Sorry? Yep. Yep. 
Uh, okay, so um, uh, it could be the case that we have a lot of, um, well, that we believe that a lot of these the, a lot of these observable features, like the mass, the age, uh, um, you know, the star formation rate, are all important. Um, so we don't want to, um, uh, so we don't want to throw any of them away. <clears throat> um, but we only have a small amount of data, and so we st we want to use all of them in the fit. Um, in order to predict future data. So say I have like uh, these 30 barred galaxies and, and I have, or say, say I have like five barred galaxies and I have like 10 possible parameters they could depend on, then I'm gonna go and uh, look for more barred galaxies um, amongst my sample. In this case, I would perhaps still want to fit a model which, uh, which uses all of those predictive variables um, and rather than simply trying to like, um, reduce my observation, or reduce my model to only like two of them, the, perhaps the best two, um, I, I might still want to use all of them. So that would be that type of case. Um, so in a real world setting, that, that sort of example was a little artificial because astronomical catalogs typically have 10,000 galaxies and you know maybe like 30 different uh, independent variables you would look at. Um, but in, in real-world settings, uh, this would actually come up in financial data quite often. You could have like um, 10,000 company indices, which, um, uh, which you want to use to predict um, something like uh, um, uh, a year's worth of, um, of mean returns on, on the stock market or something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I just wanted to remark that for those of us who like uh, Ed James's book, he has a really good quote about the um, about the idea that you can't fit more than you can't have more parameters than the number of data points, mm. which um, you, you can do, and sometimes it just means you'll end up with a lot of uncertainty. Other times it um, it works out fine, but there's nothing that prevents you from doing it in principle. And I had thought of an example that was good, but it's just escaped my head. So I'll try and remember. <laughs> I'll try and remember it. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, it's I, not I, coming back. Yeah, I do like the kind of financial example because it's um, uh, it, it it's quite realistic in the sense that you know we we have good data which we want to use. Say we have accurate you know, sort of uh, share prices for, for a huge number of companies, but then we might want to use that to predict something for which we only have a small number of observations, like the quarterly um, inflation rate or something like this. So um, uh, for that type of model, we could just uh, cut it down to the, you know, the S&P 500 and only regress on this, but um, we might better capture our uncertainties if we put everything in. Yeah. Um, I actually just remembered what the example was. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's in statistical mechanics where you have uh, like 10 to the power of 23 unknowns. So all, mm -hmm. the, um, all the positions and velocities of all your particles say. Mm -hmm. And you constrain it with, uh, with one value, which is the total energy. And right. so you're, in a sense, you're inferring 10 to the 23 unknowns from one, uh, from one observable. And you're... Um, your posterior distribution from that still has obviously heaps of degeneracies in it, but it's good enough to make predictions of other things. Yep. So, yeah, there's nothing in principle that says you can't have more um, unknowns than knowns. Yep. Right. So, when you in that case, you you need to introduce a Bayesian model, which provides the regularization because the maximum likelihood fit just wouldn't exist. Yeah. Um, Can I just add a quick comment? I think the important thing also. Sorry, I'm here. <laughs> Sorry. What's the problem with this mic? Yeah. Um, I think the important thing to remember is, of course, if you, you can, there's nothing principle wrong, absolutely mm. right, uh, but the resulting parameters will be correlated yep. in general. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so, they'll, um, which isn't necessarily a problem, but it's yep. something to be, to be aware of. So. Cool. Um, so then one final example uh, would be for the case where you know that your observations uh, don't actually contain a lot of information about some of the parameters deep in the model. So you, you, you want to allow them to be somewhat learnt from the data, but you know that if you just allow for a very, um, a very sort of um, uh, broad, uninformative prior, then um, either those parameters will be very poorly learnt, or there'll be some kind of degeneracies in them, which um, which will make exploring the posterior more difficult than it needs to be. 
Um, and this case comes up a lot in for Gaussian processes where the range and the scale of the parameter, um, and if you don't know what those means, we'll, we'll definitely we'll come back to this later on, where the range and the scale are um, inherently degenerate um, for most sort of data sets, which will be fitting a Gaussian process too. So um, in these cases, we, we want the prior to, uh, to come along and, and help um, kind of, uh, you know, herd our, our posterior into a sensible region of parameter space. Um, so the final way I would, I would like to talk about um, this notion of thinking about priors is as far as completing the generative model. So um, a proper Bayesian model, um, in the sense that if we, we don't have uh, an improper prior, like the, the sort of the uniform over negative infinity to infinity, but for a proper Bayesian model, uh, then what we have is a model which defines a complete data generating process before you actually observe any data. So if we write down a hierarchical model, um, we should be able to, um, or effectively, by writing down a hierarchical model, we've written down an algorithm for drawing mock data sets, which we could have observed. So in the, the sense would be, uh, you write down a Bayesian model, what would you predict data to look like? Well, it will look like if you just repeated this process multiple times, you draw a vector of parameters from your prior, you draw a mock data set from the sampling distribution implied by the likelihood function under those parameters, and then you repeat the process. And if you did this like 10,000 times, you'd have 10,000 mock data sets drawn from the distribution um, uh, produced by your Bayesian model um, before any data was actually seen. So when so a very good idea is when you write down a hierarchical model to actually go through this process and, um, and see what your model is saying about the types of data it expects you to see. Um, so there's an, a really nice example in this paper um, uh, called Visualizing Bayesian Data Analysis or something like that. Anyway, this is, this is the authors here. Um, and they go through this, well, their model problem is this, that they, um, uh, they want to predict the um, uh, concentration of some type of um, air pollutant uh, in, different, in different countries. And they have observations from monitoring stations in the countries, and they want to supplement those with some satellite observations, which also are thought to provide some kind of information on the amount of particulate matter um, that you would have. And so um, what they did was they, they wrote down a, a model structure which looked kind of sensible to them. And uh, then at some point they said, um, okay, like this plot here shows what the actual data looks like. Um, there's a relationship between uh, the log of, of this covariate predict provided by the satellite and the log of the observed um, particulate matter concentration in some, some arbitrary units. And uh, the actual data says like they're, they're kind of similar, that they, they share um, more or less a, a common scale. But they, and remember this is logarithmic units, um, but then they said, okay, we've got this model, the priors are quite uninformative, let's draw some mock data. Um, and they found out that if they drew simulated data um, uh, from their prior, that in fact um, the model had said what it expected to see was, uh, was observed particulate matter um, concentrations, which would basically be um, 400 orders of magnitude larger than what the actual observed data looked like. Um, so, you know, in reality, this would be like having a dense, uh, possibly soup-like fog of, <laughs> of, uh, of, of, of smog over the whole of Europe. And uh, so, you know, they realized that, well, we have a model that, um, uh, you know, we, is theoretically uninformative, but um, because it's, it's um, a, you know, sort of a priori putting so much weight on this really crazy area of, area of parameter space, um, it's probably not a sensible thing to do. Um, and so they, they um, uh, thought m more carefully about their priors, placed sensible constraints, and came up with, with a revised priors for which if they generated mock data, certainly they have a much larger range, say like perhaps five orders of magnitude uh, greater, or potentially as much as five order, orders of magnitude uh, greater than the actual observations, but they were at least within the ballpark, so they, um, so, you know, they um, were sort of satisfied that they, they were no longer doing something really crazy. Um, Brendan? I love this discussion and that 
quote at the bottom is, is really excellent. Um, I thought I'd mention that if you are going to do model comparison in the Bayesian way using marginal likelihoods to calculate Bayes factors and so on, um, which we were supposed to cover but didn't actually, um, this kind of thing is really important to do because if, say, you had two different models and you wanted to do model comparison and one of your models had some kind of really wide priors in it and the other one didn't, then sometimes the result of your model comparison might be an artifact of the fact that uh, one of your models had no idea of the data yeah. to within you know, 100 orders of magnitude and the other one did. So uh, generating mock data sets from your prior assumptions is really good. Yep. Thanks. Um, so yeah, the, um, the one last thing I would say on this is um, uh, that it's the same goes um, not just for generating, so this algorithm of generating um, mock data from your prior, you can also apply it to generating um, sort of mocks of what the latent variables that you've added to the model are. So um, from a Gaussian process, you can draw uh, sort of realizations of that Gaussian process, and in fact, um, that plot I had over here, these are, you know, might well be realizations drawn from a prior. Um, and the point is that uh, you can do that just as you can for generating the mocks of the observable data, and usually some kind of visual inspection of those will give you a clue as to whether your model is doing something sensible. Um, and it's particularly important when the ingredient of the model is something really really abstract or, or really strange, uh, where you don't have a good feel for what the hyperparameters actually do. So, you know, you might set a hyperprior which says we think the um, sort of, like, the, the breaking rate of this crazy um, Mondrian process is, is uh, between, you know, uh, x and y. And then we draw mock data and actually um, it really doesn't look like anything we want it to look like. So we'd say, okay, what, what we, what's going on here? And, uh, this type of diagnostic, I think, is um, uh, is really a, a key way to sort of um, interrogate your priors and, and um, uh, you know and get thinking about what they're actually doing to the model. So I think actually I should stop there because it's eleven. Keep strictly to the coffee breaks, and then uh, I'll just pick this up uh, half in half an hour. Okay. So um, please, before you leave, make sure that your installation is good. Once your installation is good, then you can go and have coffee. <laughs> you have 30 minutes, so we start exactly at 11.30.